In this lecture, we are going to be looking at the genetic and physiological adaptations that humans have made when moving to higher altitudes, right? So we already kind of talked about last lecture um, how our physiology varies in response to different levels of ultraviolet radiation, um, different levels of average temperature. Um, even we talked a little bit about how humidity can alter your facial features like your nose. Um, so today we're going to kind of just address how does high altitude change human physiology and we'll look at two specific groups we'll kind of look at the native uh tibetans over in uh, asia and we'll look at the native andeans um, down in south america so based on what we talked about in the last lecture we can start with some basic assumptions that humans evolved in a semi-tropical habitat in eastern africa more particularly eastern ethiopia all humans have the basic tropical adaptations and survival in cold temperatures really depends on um, initially cultural adaptations like fire clothing and shelter so when we talk about altitude, we're dealing with some significant stressors. And how do we really define what is altitude, right? So high altitude is defined as heights that are above 2,500 feet in elevation. Today, roughly 140 million people worldwide live in what would be considered high altitude environments. So what stressors do human populations deal with when they are living in high altitudes? Well, there are high amounts of solar radiation, so high levels of ultraviolet radiation. There are very cold temperatures, right? You have a 10 degree drop in temperature per 100 feet in elevation that you go up, right? So it can get pretty cold in very high elevation areas. There is low oxygen or low oxygen levels at high altitude high altitudes. Uh, there's low food availability, right? Not a whole lot of agricultural products can grow in high altitude environments. There's also high winds as well as very low levels of humidity. In terms of evolution, humans have been living at high altitudes for about 35,000 years. Native Tibetans have been living at high altitudes for at least 10,000 years. Humans evolved independently or evolved high altitude adaptations independently at three separate locations. The first location where we see some um, high altitude adaptations in human populations is the Ante Andean Altiplano, um, which is in South America. And there are roughly 35 million inhabitants here living at or above um, high altitude elevations. If we look at the Tibetan Plateau in Asia, there are roughly 80 million inhabitants living in a high altitude environment. And finally, we have the Ethiopian highlands. Um, there is archeological evidence that human populations have been living there for thousands of years. It's not a very well studied um, area. Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of current research is being done in this area to try and figure out um, where exactly or how long people have been living at high altitude and it's important because as humans we know that we evolved in ethiopia right so it's very likely that this high altitude environment is where we first acquired those basal genetic adaptations to high altitude stressors that we'll be talking about um, later on in this lecture so what force are we really talking about that causes this um this change in our physiology and um, in some cases our genetic makeup in terms of populations living at high altitudes, it's really this notion of hypoxia, right? So we really must develop biological adaptations. Uh, hypoxia cannot be dealt with with cultural adaptations, right? And hypoxia is simply a very fancy term for lack of oxygen, right? So, you know, it's not culturally tenable for everyone to be walking around uh, wearing oxygen tanks all the time if you're living at a high altitude, right? So you have to develop some sort of biological adaptation to that. And hypoxia is also defined as low availability of oxygen for your blood tissues, right? And hypoxia causes a distinct drop in fitness, right? Uh, lack of oxygen can cause growth abnormalities in pregnant women. Um, it can also cause a condition called preeclampsia um, during childbirth, which is actually really bad at high altitudes and uh, in most cases leads to death. So other kind of effects of hypoxia, you have an increase in DNA mutation rates, you have an insensitivity to P53-mediated apoptosis, so your cells begin to die. 
Um, you have decreased cell proliferation rate. You have decreased oxygen availability and nutrient permeability. Um, drugs become less effective, and you have more soluble factors within your cells and your bloodstream, right? So oxygen is extremely important in keeping uh, homeostasis within your body in terms of oxygen as well as other biochemicals within your tissues. Air pressure does decrease as you climb in elevation at 2,500 feet. Breathing delivers roughly 10% less oxygen than it does at sea level, right? So the first initial symptoms you're going to see of hypoxia are shortness of breath, uh, painful breathing, as well as uh, variations in your heart rate. So if we look at some data that was acquired from military training at high altitudes, they noted that the normal caloric intake per meal at sea level was around 1,500 calories, but at high altitude, it is 4,500 calories. At high altitude, it takes 1,700 calories a day just to breathe, right? So you can imagine this is why some athletes will kind of cheat the system by going to high altitude environments to train for short periods of time because it causes this acclimatization period, which causes you to have a very, very high caloric uh, burning rate. Um, and they also noted in some of the journals that the platoons are very, very irritable at high altitudes because it becomes very difficult to kind of do very basic daily functions when you're dealing with less oxygen in your breathing air. So in terms of the systems in your body, which are affected by low oxygen environments, right, you have the cardiovascular system, which consists of your heart, your blood vessels, and uh, your blood, right, that's your pump and pipe system. You have your respiratory system, which consists of your lungs and your air pathways, as well as hemoglobin, right, which is a protein that carries oxygen to the tissues throughout your body. All of these systems are affected by hypoxia. So if we take an in-depth look at hemoglobin real quick, the protein that carries oxygen throughout your body. It consists of two alpha chains and two beta chains. Each polypeptide chain carries an iron heme group. The net result of that is that you can carry four oxygen molecules per hemoglobin molecules, right? And it works, um, you know, this oxygen delivery system works by simple diffusion, right? So you're diffusing that oxygen across cellular surfaces. So in essence, we lowlanders, when we go to a high altitude environment, we acclimatize to that environment by breathing faster, making more red blood cells and more mitochondria within our cells. Failure to acclimatize as a lowlander moving to a high altitude environment can lead to four separate conditions. You have acute mountain sickness, you have pulmonary edema, as well as general edema and a condition called chronic mountain sickness. In pulmonary edema, in essence, what happens is your um, lungs start to lose the ability to dispense fluids within your uh, vesicles, so they begin to build up and you essentially drown on your own bodily fluids, right? This is the result of having a lack of oxygen in order for the system to function properly. And high altitude pulmonary edema is not a pleasant condition, right? If we look at the earliest recorded instance of high altitude pulmonary edema, we say um, from the writing, it said they suddenly encountered a cold wind, which made them shiver and unable to speak. Hui Ring could not go any farther. A white froth came from his mouth and he said, I cannot live any longer. Do you immediately go away? That we do not all die here. And with those, these words, he died, right? And that came from a Buddhist missionary in 330 AD, right? So in essence, that fluid builds up in your lungs and you begin to choke on that, uh, on that fluid. So if we look at chronic mountain sickness, um, the, you have a red cell mass which increases and your hematocrit levels become very high. Your pulmonary arterial pressure becomes elevated even more than normal elevation that occurs during acclimatization. So in essence, you're pushing too much blood through your system, right? You may have right ventricular atrophy or hyperatrophy within your uh, arterial system and your heart. You'll have perif peripheral arterial pressure will begin to fall and you'll develop congestive heart failures, right? So death occurs unless the person is removed to a lower altitude environment, right? So it's essence, your heart becomes overworked from the pushing of blood that is far too thick, that's full of too many red blood cells. 
If we look at chronic mountain sickness, this is a condition that we really only see among Andean populations in South America. It's found among fully acclimatized people who were born as lowlanders and who have lived at high altitudes for long periods of time. So they went through that acclimatization period when they first moved to high altitudes, but over the period of time, that continual stress on their body and not having the underlying genetic foundation or genetic adaptations that we see in groups like the Tibetans, those lowlanders who have move to high altitude end up developing this chronic mountain sickness. If we talk about our basic uh, adaptations that all humans have, uh, know that every lung full of air at 12,000 feet has only 60% of the oxygen it would have at sea level, right? And know that you, the arterial blood within your body gives up oxygen to your mitochondria in order for your mitochondria to produce energy, right? So we, in our cells, we have these O2 sensors, and if they become hypoxic, certain genes within our genome get turned on, and erythropoietin, a hormone, is made and released, right? The net result of that is the production of more red blood cells and more hemoglobin, which means more O2 saturation and oxygen homeostasis. But if you have too much hemoglobin and too many red blood cells, it can cause that mountain sickness we talked about because the blood becomes too thick, right? So in essence, all humans have a basic kind of adaptation within their genome to deal with high altitude uh, environments, but they cannot sustain that for long periods of time, otherwise it develops deleterious conditions within their body, right? So humans can go to high altitudes um, and essentially move around there for short periods of time, but if they don't get back to lowland after you know a few decades, they end up developing these conditions. Um, conversely, if you're looking at a population like the Tibetans who have lived at high altitudes for thousands and thousands of years, they don't deal with that problem, right? They um, have these ge base genetic adaptations that have kind of um, changed a little bit that have allowed them to stay without developing these kind of chronic conditions from long uh, periods of hypoxic exposure. So all humans, along with that genetic uh, adaptation producing more red blood cells, um, if surviving your three-day acclimatization period, you will begin to grow new capillaries in your lung tissue, right? So mainly within your kind of lungs and heart, right? And uh, to the right, you can kind of see this increase in heart capillary tissue. And what this is doing is it's increasing the ways in which you can have oxygen exchange between your vascular system and your tissues, right? The more arteries means the more red blood cells can be delivered which means the more oxygen can be delivered to your tissues, right? So in essence, your body is trying to offset the low oxygen in the air by increasing the oxygen saturation capabilities of your arterial system. So if we look at high altitude adaptations among our Andeans in South America, there are two distinct cultural groups. You have the Quechua of Peru and the Ayamara of Bolivia. Uh, both populations display similar physiological adaptations as they are short in stature with very large barrel chests, right? As a matter of fact, their limbs kind of seem very short and stocky compared to how large their midsection is, their chest section is. Um, and this is because they have increased lung size and capacity as well as a thicker and heavier heart, right? They have higher hematocrit levels, which leads to higher O2 saturation, and they have a process or an increased process of erythrocytosis, which is producing larger red cell mass. Lowlanders who moved to highland areas in childhood and lived there display permanent acclimatization responses, but these Andean populations do run the risk of developing that chronic mountain sickness condition. If we look at the high altitude Nepalese, on the other hand, they have stunted skeletal. So native Tibetans have a higher vascularization of their tissues. They have more capillaries, which open up in tissues than um, those people at sea level, about 25% more. Um, the growth of new capillary tissues are in non-pulmonary uh, tissues as well, something that we refer to as angiogenesis, right? So they have a high degree of angiogenesis. So this uh, combined with systemic vasodilation, um, which is also a hypoxic uh, 
um, response allows for more O2 delivery to the tissues, right? So in essence, these uh, Tibetan people have adapted by creating more capillaries on average for their tissues, even in um, areas in which we normally don't see capillary growth for oxygen delivery. And they also have a vasodilation of their arterial system, which allows for um, an increase in O2 delivery to um, cellular organisms, right? So in essence, what we're looking at is a kind of uh, two-pronged response to living at high altitudes for long periods of time. And we also have an interesting case study um, in terms of our Tibetan uh, Nepalese uh, Highlanders. Uh, it's very interesting. We have um, two groups that live in this area. We have the native Tibetans who have lived there for at least 10,000 years, but they have been visiting there, we know, archaeologically from for about 35,000 years. The Han Chinese cultural group, on the other hand, has only been these high altitudes since about 1950. The major genetic difference between these two groups is that the Tibetans have a distinctive gene pool that ensures hemoglobin will have a very high O2 saturation. They don't make way more hemoglobin. They don't make way more blood cells, but what they have carries more oxygen, right? The Han Chinese, on the other hand, respond to high altitude pressure with producing much more or much higher hemoglobin or red blood cell concentration. So why does the difference between these two groups really matter? Well, because it's good to dampen the acclimatization response because high hemoglobin concentrations within your body could lead to poor pregnancy outcomes, right? So relating this back to our the name of the game in evolution, right, reproduction, anything that affects reproduction is going to be acted upon by some sort of selective force, right? Some sort of whether it's natural selection or whether it's genetic drift, i.e. some sort of selective force is going to act upon that to change it, right? Otherwise, the species would go extinct. So in essence, um, Tibetan women do have better pregnancy outcomes than the Han Chinese have because they have been in those altitudes long enough to develop that mechanism to offset the negative consequences, right? So they don't produce more red blood cells because evolutionarily, uh, during the time they were living there, they realized or uh, kind of genetically realized that having higher blood concentrations is not going to be sustainable in the long run. So their bodies adapted by creating an oxygen delivery system, which was more efficient, right? Their blood carries more oxygen. The Han Chinese, on the other hand, who have not been there as long, have not had that level or that ability to um, really uh, – develop that genetic adaptation, right? They have the kind of basic adaptation of producing way more red blood cells, which is why their pregnancy outcomes are not as good as the native Tibetans. We also have several uh, Tibetan cultural adaptations, which um, kind of further their um, ability to live at high al altitude um, environments, right? They practice fraternal polyandry, which means that there is one wife and multiple husbands. Women will generally marry brothers, and this is done to increase the chances of having more women within the society, right? And it's done to increase the number of potential pregnancies as well as increase the parental investment from all of the brothers, right? Um, they're very unlikely to have kind of internal conflict and things like that, um, and brothers are very unlikely likely to kind of abandon the family as a whole because one, they have children there, they have a wife there, and they are also related to the other men that are married to the woman, right? So it all works to promote um, cultural solidarity in this very small cultural group. So some other adaptations that we see compared to the Han Chinese and lowlanders, Tibetan women will send more blood to the womb during pregnancy, perhaps overall. Uh, Tibetans may have better circulation and deliver blood faster to the tissues. We know this because they have very, very warm hands to the touch, no matter what environment they are in. Between the Han Chinese and Tibetans, there are gene differences, right? Tibetans have the EGLN1 and the EPAS1 gene, which are selected for, and the EPA1 or EPAS1 gene is found in very low frequency amongst lowlanders. So to compare the two groups, our two high altitude human populations, our Andeans from South America and our Tibetans from Asia, um, they are both short in stature. Um, your Andeans uh, have adapted by having higher levels of red blood cells, whereas your Tibetans have adapted by having higher O2 saturation. 
Um, you have no NO synthesis in Andean populations, but you have very high NO synthesis in Tibetan populations. And both populations tend to mature later. So what you're seeing is just slight variations in the genetic mechanisms which control oxygen delivery uh, to tissues within the body, right? So it's two slightly different ways in which these high altitude populations have adapted to the significant stressor of hypoxia. So just to give you kind of an update on where we are currently with the research of high altitude populations in Ethiopia, they have identified a set of gene variants at the same loci as the genes, as our he normal hemoglobin genes. Um, these are the variants you have CBARA1, VAV3, ARNT2, and THRB. And these result in higher levels of hemoglobin production than lowlander Ethiopians, right? So what we're seeing is that really that genetic adaptation, again, even within our Ethiopian population, is still at that locus which controls the hemoglobin molecule, right? The blood molecule, right? So really our genetic adaptations for high altitude hypoxic stress really relate back to how we have differences in the blood system. 